thank you very much for coming. It's uh, an interrogation all down here because really bright lights, so. Um, oh, okay. Good, yeah, well, um, this is gonna be somehow different for me. I hope it's going to be still great for you. I usually talk about UX and everything that has to do with the UX, from UX and machine learning to all sorts of things that have to do with UX. And I'm very close to development, but I actually am not a developer. So please um, be kind. This is me. Does it work? Yeah. So um, I am a UX designer and I do the whole thing that UX designers do, like I do a lot of research, I talk to users, I talk to stakeholders, and I do design. I don't do the pretty design, I just do like figuring out what users need and making like the, the whole choreography of what has to be built. And I do a lot of prototypes. And the prototypes I do, they are highly interactive. They have, uh, they usually are prototypes for projects with a lot of complexity and they have to feel real. They have to feel, they have to be usable and users have to see what they are going to get. They have to simulate the whole behavior of the thing. And in complex projects, that's usually highly interactive and with data entry and everything. So the prototypes I built, they, they are built with realistic data. Um, that's really important if you want to show or simulate behavior. You have to have real data. You can do that with lorem ipsum or stuff like that. And to do that, I uh, built a prototyping tool. And um, this is why I'm also a fake stack developer. And the tool uh, I've built is just all facade. The data I'm using comes from a YAML file or comes from a Google spreadsheet. There is no database behind it. There is no security. There is no, nothing that it would be considered as professional programming, like object-oriented programming. No, 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 nothing of that. It's just fake stack. So if, if you have like the real stack, like here you have your front end and your back end, you would take like the back end and you would substitute it with something that, will, that keeps the thing up. Like it simulates the data and this, it simulates user session, it simulates being logged in. And in the front end, you also sort of change stuff. It has to look okay. It isn't the real deal, but it's sort of somewhere there. So it's the black and white version of you, the, the final thing, more or less. And that's what the fake stack is. So in order to do that, I built a prototyping tool. It's called Protostrap. I'm not gonna go into much detail about Protostrap. Only one thing, just to sum it up, it's amazing. And <laughs> it can do things other prototyping tools can't do. It can do all stuff that it would take a lot of effort to do that, for example, in Xsure or in Just in Mind. And it, can, it's, it is, it is uh, directed to designers. It's built for designers. So they don't necessarily have to know much about coding. If you want to do interactive prototyping and you use, for example, Framer or Framer X, you would need quite a lot uh, of knowledge about React to do that. And designers, they want to do things fast. They want to focus on design and not necessarily code. And Protostrap lets you do that. And I make a living using it. That's, I, I really make quite a bunch of money with that. And so I open sourced it and no one else uses it. I have zero adoption, like no one. 
And this talk is about how and why I sort of failed at open source. And I want to begin the this, this story going back to 2010. That's um, the time when we did prototypes mostly in a wireframey way using tools like Balsamic. And especially for mobile, prototyping was a pain. Testing was a complete joke. I mean, you couldn't test things on mobile. You had to either show the screens on a desktop or print them out and stick them on cardboard and, okay, now next cardboard. And it was just no, no real experience. At that time, all these tools that you would use today, I just picked a few, that's totally, that's the few that came to my, the first that came to my mind. Um, most of the tools, they either were not even around or just about to be invented, or they were just not good enough. And a while later, I, uh, I started to really scratch my own itch. I had a project of the um, uh, what's the, uh, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Yeah, that's the name. Uh, the DEZA, we call it DEZA in Switzerland. And DEZA is um, an agency that helps in the uh, de developing countries, helps them, helps help themselves building infrastructure like wells, like schools, just um, helping other countries uh, build the country. And they have a lot of um, field personnel and a lot of employees out in the field and they approached us and um, they wanted their intranet, they wanted their employees to access their intranet on the field over their mobile. So somewhere in Southeast Asia, in, in Africa, uh, South America, um, employees would have to be able to um, access the internet over the phone. And what we, what we needed was a tool to prototype that and to prototype that mobile experience with real data. And I was, I was totally sure this would never work no way they would sort of understand how it would work if we show them like balsamic mockups. What we needed was something like this, so that you can open it and on a device and see what it is. And this is a photo I took like three days ago. So the prototype, I just went to the prototype. It's still working after all these years, which is sort of amazing, like, okay, it's the web, of course it works. And yeah, we, we wanted to have a, a tool that could prototype these experiences, but not only for mobile, for all sorts of uh, experiences. And that's how Protostrap got born. And yeah, we, I was working at an agency called Leap then, and uh, within Leap we, we sort of started building that, or I started building that within Leap, let's put it this way, and I realized, well, this is really helpful. This is really fast, and it gets the thing done, and it's, it's easy to use. Let's open source it. And nobody cared. It just was just completely irrelevant. And before, us, before open sourcing it, the assumption was, okay, let's build something useful, let's open source it, and everybody wins. That was like the equation uh, I made, and it was just, no, that's not how it works. First of all, define useful. That is a, a whole separate story. 
And then, well, open sourcing something doesn't make sure that people will embrace it, take it over, adopt it. So I have the feeling that open sourcing is like handing out the keys to a workshop, like where you have all the tools, but it's mostly not a workshop like that, but it's something like this, where it's really messy and it's dark and you have just a torch to figure your way through that open source project. And that is the problem of, okay, I just open source stuff. So there's a few hurdles you have to overcome in order to, to have an open, uh, an open source project that is like a well-lit, well-instructed workshop. So, <laughs> you know, the first reaction is because I'm so special. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, they don't get it. Uh, designers don't care. Uh, it's because I'm not using X. I'm using PHP. I'm not, no, not using Node. Um, uh, more tweets will fix it. And yeah, you know. Introspection took a while to kick in. And it's, I think it's normal. It takes a while until you realize that actually you should take a hard look at yourself. And I made a few mistakes. Um, first of all, no documentation. I mean, a readme is okay, but it's not a documentation. Especially for a tool that is really so large. The tool has a documentation now, but uh, at the time there was none. No allies. I was, it was just me and no real connections outside, outside myself. Uh, no plan, no roadmap. It was just like I stumbled over stuff that I wanted to do and I did it, but I didn't have like a vision where it would go. The vision was, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna take care of everything. No frequent releases, like sporadic sometime. And no process, none at all. So, Documentation, I want to go through these points because there, there is very much behind that. Documentation, documentation is the hardest easy win. It's an easy win, but it's really hard to get that. And first of all, it's hard to understand in a way that people understand. That is something that uh, is much more difficult than I thought. And also, documenting, documentation is something like math. Examples go a really long way. So just documenting your, your functions, your, your whatever you use in your, in your tool, without sort of giving guidance how to apply that is really hard. Documentation was a savior. Um, a few years after open sourcing Protostrap, I started building my own company. At first I was alone, but then after my first hire, I realized I'm expecting, to, I'm expecting someone to use the tool that there is no documentation of, and I was just sitting there all the time explaining stuff, and it was such a drag, and having a documentation was so liberating, just like, oh, and now I just spend a lot of time looking up stuff in my own documentation because you build something and then you use it two years later and what was that? Okay, good thing I have a documentation. Allies. Having allies, I mean, it's a no-brainer that many brains are better than one. And it's really important to find allies early on, really early on. 
And allies can be all sorts of roles, all sorts of people, like development partners, for example, or um, mentors. Look, look, look for and find mentors, people that have experience in open sourcing, that can, can give you guidance on how it's done, that can give you guidance on how a software project is built to be released in, 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 in cycles, all that things. Um, ally, uh, allies can be advocates that know your solution and can tell um, others about this great thing you're doing. Find sponsors that's, that can be companies that sponsor time for other people to work on, on, uh, uh, on your open source. The value of allies is that they really help you focus. They give the project a direction and a purpose, and you sort of become accountable for the stuff that is happening within the project. And that helps a lot. I have Protostrap, which is one project, and I have another one that is a few weeks old, and now I'm starting to do all that in there, like, okay, I have allies, I have um, um, development partners, I have all that thing, all, all those things, and the new project I'm working on has already more people uh, adopting it than the seven-year-old protostrap, which is sort of like, what? And it, it shows the value of, of especially allies. Allies are the most important part of propelling your work forward. Make a plan. It's really important to, to figure out what your pipeline is going to be. What are you going to build? Why? What is the benefit? How are you going to sequentially deliver that? and share that. Make it clear that when people come to the, the repository or to your website or whatever, that they see what lies ahead. Maybe, maybe your solution is not a good fit now, but it may be one later, so uh, they're more likely to adopt it maybe at a later point. It's really important to show that your project really has a future. But it's not only important to show that your project has a future, it's also important to show that your project has a life. So people see that it is active. And it's also important not, not to just make big releases every year, make also minor releases, small releases. The small releases, don't, don't under, underestimate the small releases. They are just like a pulse of your project. I don't know how many times someone came to me and said, oh, you had this tool, but you haven't been doing stuff on that for, for a really long time, so I, I assume it's dead. So no, 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 I just didn't, I just didn't uh, release anything, but I'm... I'm adding stuff and, and committing stuff to the, to the development uh, branch all the time. And it took me a while to realize, oh, actually, that is a mistake. Like, people, people look at your, or at your um, uh, history and see if, if there was any activity. So if you have a flat line, people are going to not really like it. Figure out a process, how, how you actually, not only what you're going to build, but how, how is that going to happen? So how do new features or uh, old features in a new form get done? So the whole release early and release often part, yeah? We all know, know that, but actually the whole sentence should be release early, release often is hard. Because, yeah, what exactly do we release? And how does that process work? 
And there's a few like guidelines, or, or not guidelines, but a few um, things to keep in mind. Like writing is rewriting. That is true for any profession that does anything that puts something from mind to paper, be it, I don't know, storytelling or programming. If you don't rewrite your stuff, it will be just a first idea. And another thing to keep in mind is focus on benefit, not features. That should guide your process. That should guide how you're going to, to deliver things. So you don't deliver features, you deliver benefit. And if you can structure your process, your plan, your everything of, around the benefit you're going to deliver, that, that is much easier to, to comprehend than, OK, now we have feature this and feature that and we feature x, y, z. I spoke about the mistakes I made. But that's not all. That's, that's only one small part of it. Another part is understanding adoption. So having documentation, having all that, those things, that's good. But actually, it's worthwhile spending a while on understanding adoption. So adoption. <coughs> If you want to gain adoption, you have to help people become users. And to help them become users, you have, you have to help them overcome the friction that comes with adoption. So you want them to push the thing forward, but there is friction. And you have to help them overcome the things that hold them back. So. Adoption has several points that give it friction, like what are you replacing? Are you aware of what you are replacing or, or, or what you are building to... You, you, maybe you are not replacing a tool, but a process or an old way of doing things. To which extent are you, are you replacing it? Are you a good replacement or are, are you just a partial replacement for a definite, uh, well-defined set of people. What burdens do you create when you, um, uh, when people want to adopt your solution? It's not just like, okay, we, we just adopt it. How much do they have to learn? What is the, le the learning curve for your tool? What is the financial strain they have to put on. How fast can this be done? How much infrastructure is, is needed to be able to do that? that is, those are burdens that have to be taken into consideration. And being aware of those burdens helps making a product that, that minifies that burden as much as possible. In the end, it comes down to is the benefit you're creating worth the hassle? And that's not the same as the friction itself, the hassle that going through all, all the hoops and loops. Does it really pay off? And that's something that's really beneficial if you're aware of that. So users are like the sun. It's your most valuable resource. It's like the thing you you sh really should focus on. Focus on users first. Because users become collaborators. If you want people to join your project as collaborators, they have to see the value in it. They have to be somehow engaged in it, use it, or help others use it within an organization. And that is... 
to achieve that, you have to answer a few questions. And first and most of all, you have to answer the question, what do they need? So what do they need to adopt it? What do they need to understand it? What do they need to, to do with it? And also, what do they say? What is the feedback you're getting? Are you paying attention? That is really important. And if you pay attention, you will solve a lot of problems a lot faster than if you would do it on your own. It's the one brain is, uh, many brains are better than one brain thing, again. So, this is my interpretation of the Wish You Were Here uh, album cover by Pink Floyd. I just was walking around the street and I saw that and I said, oh, that looks like that co uh, album cover. So, it stands for the person you wish you had, but it's not there. And, you know, like the allies that are not there, the allies, the, the users, the collaborators that are sort of missing. And don't beat yourself up if uh, there is zero adoption, because zero adoption doesn't mean zero value. So, if you do everything right, if you build something useful, if you find allies, if you do your homework, that's writing all the documentation, all the steps you need, if you focus on users, then everybody wins. And if not everybody wins, at least you win, because you will have a tool that helps you as well. OK. So stay yourself. Keep being unique. Keep doing stuff. Thanks. I'm Mamie.